Hello. Welcome to the Pirate History Podcast. My name is Matt. Thank you for listening. Last time we talked about John Benbow, a man who was soon to be in our overall narrative, the most famous naval officer in England. We left off when he was fired from his post in the Royal Navy, though, due to slander of superior officers. As a private citizen, living in Tangier, Binbo bought himself a ship, one of those captured Barbary Corsair vessels, and with it he started up a merchant shipping business. He traded primarily in the kinds of luxury goods that were enjoyed by Europeans living on the coast of Barbary. He brought in food and clothes and books, including books like the Buccaneers of America. But more than anything else, the one thing that all Europeans craved which they could not find in the Muslim world was alcohol. The Age of Sail, and the Golden Age of Piracy in particular, are almost inseparable from alcohol. Rum, in particular, is an integral part of the pirate myth. There's even that song, the most famous song in all of pirate mythology. That's what popped up when I googled, why is the rum gone? But obviously here we're talking about Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island classic, Dead Man's Chest. Yo-ho-ho and a bottle of rum. And all you have to do is go shopping for a bottle of rum sometime, and you'll see maybe a third of the bottles on offer have some kind of pirate branding. Those that don't more than likely have either a nautical or a Caribbean theme. The reasons for that are interesting, and we will get there, but today I want to take a deeper dive into the history of alcohol and the role that it played in society at large. A role that would influence maritime history, early modern naval traditions, and the pirates who lived within them. This is episode 211, A History of Alcohol. The history of alcohol is the history of civilization itself. It goes hand in hand with all of the other cornerstones of civilization like writing and agriculture, pottery and prostitution. And when I say integral to civilization, I mean the dawn of civilization. You just have to look at something like the Epic of Gilgamesh from ancient Mesopotamia. The Epic has two main characters. There's Gilgamesh himself, a cultured, refined, civilized warrior king. And then there's his sidekick, Enkidu. Enkidu is the prototypical wild man. He's uncivilized and unrefined. So much so that in some versions of the epic, he's barely considered a human being. Perhaps even isn't a human being. In some depictions, he's part wolf, and in others, kind of a minotaur. Regardless, Enkidu is bestial. In the book Alcohol, A History, author Rod Phillips makes this connection. Phillips tells us that, according to the Epic of Gilgamesh, the act of drinking beer itself can make one a human being. As an example, he gives us a passage from the Epic of Gilgamesh. It reads, quote, Enkidu does not know of eating food, of beer to drink he has not been taught. The prostitute opened her mouth. She said to Enkidu, Eat the food, Enkidu. It is the luster of life. Drink the beer, as is done in this land. Enkidu ate the food until he was sated. Of the beer he drank seven cups. His soul became free and cheerful. His heart rejoiced. His face glowed. He rubbed his hairy body. He anointed himself with oil. He became human. End quote. Now, I don't fully understand how even a werewolf minotaur type would not know of eating food, but we're not talking about food today, so let's brush that aside and talk about the beer. This passage from one of the oldest epics in human history makes it clear that beer was a big deal in Mesopotamia, and it was. But the process of imbibing alcohol goes back even farther than that, 
farther than Mesopotamia, farther than civilization, even farther than humanity itself. I mean, we've all seen videos of animals gorging themselves on fallen, fermented fruit and getting, well, plastered. If you haven't, go look them up, they're fantastic, but... Beyond a bunch of wild animals, and early humans that enjoyed fermented fruit, it's really hard to pin down when humans started producing alcohol on purpose. For a long time, thanks to sources like that of Gilgamesh, it was assumed to be the Mesopotamians that came up with producing alcohol, somewhere around 5,000 years ago. But as archaeological techniques advanced in the 19th century, they started finding evidence from China as far back as 7,000 years ago. More recently, in the 20th century, we've found evidence from the central Eurasian mountains in places like Pakistan and Afghanistan and Iran that show production from as far back as 9,000 years ago. What makes this all so difficult, though, is the kind of archaeological data that we have to work with. We're talking about fragments of pottery with trace amounts of acids that might suggest the presence of alcohol. Nothing, even with some of the best scientific practices they can muster, that are absolutely definitive. Now, communities today who favor particular alcoholic drinks will argue extensively about which drink actually came first. For example, I personally am a mead nerd. I like to drink mead, I like to make mead, and talk about mead, and read about mead, and spend time on mead enthusiast forums online. Trust me, you don't want to go on a date with me to the local meadery. I will, unprompted, talk about mouthfeel. And I will mean it. It's a problem. And I would love to tell you, given all of that, that it was in fact mead that came first. One of the books I have on the topic, The Complete Mead Maker by Ken Schramm, it gives excellent examples of why mead might have come first. Arguments that, for example, rainwater could have collected in beehives prior to the existence of pottery or tightly woven baskets, and therefore the honey in the beehive would have created mead naturally. But of course, on the other hand, cider aficionados and those who favor grape and berry wines have their own arguments, and they're all good. The only thing that we can all agree on is that anyone who argues that beer came first is a fool. An utter buffoon, a, an ignoramus of the highest order. But in the end, looking at this topic objectively, we really have to rely on archaeological evidence here. And for a long time, that pointed to fruit wine. See, Fruit wine can only be produced once a year, at harvest. Once it's made, it needs to be stored in airtight containers or it will turn to vinegar. Thanks to that fact, there's a pretty strong argument that the production of wine drove the production of pottery in human civilization. We will talk about that next time, though, but that means that there's a fairly large amount of archaeological evidence pointing to wine as the first. Mostly those... Shards of pottery with trace acids and proteins that suggest fruit wine. The problem there is that beer could be produced year-round from stores of dried grain, and people tended to drink beer quickly, within a few days or maybe weeks of production. Beer was unlikely to go bad, it wasn't going to turn to vinegar, so you didn't need airtight ceramic containers. In fact, one could use open, watertight woven containers. But then most recently, some new evidence has been revealed in the very early production of alcoholic beverages. Evidence that suggests, even proves, that it was beer that came first, and that the oldest confirmed brewing equipment in the world comes from Mesopotamia. They were making beer in modern-day Israel as far back as 13,000 years ago. And the evidence for that is a relatively recent find. But it is based on evidence, rather than the former historical assumptions that beer was first created in Mesopotamia. They were right, but they were right for the wrong reasons. Now, we could talk about early alcohol production and distribution all around the world for... Uh, 
well, you could do a whole podcast about it. And they have. There's actually a pretty fun podcast called Shots of History about the story of alcohol. It's worth checking out. For our purposes today, though, we're not going to go into any real depth on the distinct styles and traditions in places like China or Central Asia or Africa or Mesoamerica. They're all fun stories and worth a look if you're interested, but they're not really super relevant to the golden age of piracy. With that in mind, we're going to stick pretty close to the classical world. That is to say, ancient Greece and Rome, Persia, really all of the lands that Alexander the Great conquered, what they call today the Middle East, and all of the cultures that would eventually sprout from those civilizations. Mostly there, we're talking about Europe and the Muslim world. And then, eventually, once Europeans begin their contact and conquest of the Americas, we will touch on Native American alcohol traditions, which do have some impact. Now, we could, and I almost did, do entire episodes on the Mesopotamian period, and especially ancient Egypt. Both regions and eras were defined mostly by beer, I think it's pretty common knowledge today that the ancient Egyptian pharaohs prescribed a steady diet of beer to their people. Most famously, they fed beer to the slaves who built their pyramids and other large architectural wonders. That was a low-alcohol, high-carbohydrate beer, though. You know, liquid bread, it's been called, with just enough of a kick to keep the slaves sleepy and docile come nighttime. But that grain slurry was not for the pharaohs. For themselves, they drank wine, as did the kings in Sumeria and Persia and Babylon. It was a kingly drink. Wine was harder to make and especially harder to store, but beyond that, wine held a kind of religious symbolism in all of those cultures. It was a mystical drink, in some cases seen as a magical drink. And then, of course, there are the obvious allusions to blood. Wine was often spilled in conjunction with blood in sacrifices, both animal and human. I guess they poured a bit out for their homies. Oh, God, I'm sorry about that one. But it's the kind of power that wine holds in stories like that of Dracula and that of Jesus Christ. But then there came a people who were less enamored with the magical properties of wine. They were a people who democratized their wine, just as they democratized so many other facets of their life. We're talking about the ancient Greeks and, later on, the Romans. Now, the normalization of vino in Greco-Roman society has a lot to do with the ease of growing grapes in southern Europe. It was a lot easier and a lot cheaper to produce wine in Italy than it was to import it to Babylon. But I really can't ignore the symbolism here. You know, the Greeks invented democracy, and the Romans, well, they killed their kings and instituted the Roman Republic. And in both Greece and Rome, they demystified the mystical powers that wine held in the minds of the East. First, though, I will say, in Greece, it was actually Mede that came first. That's often pointed to as the real identity of the mythical ambrosia, a drink of the gods in ancient Greece and in India, as it happens. And, boy, I could, I could really dwell on that. If we had the time, I would go into great detail all the way back to the Proto-Indo-European peoples of the Central Eurasian steppe. And, more specifically their language. However, for now, all I will do is note that the origins for words like honey and wine, and most especially for bees, can be found in that Proto-Indo-European language. It's no surprise that we find evidence of ancient mead production, you know, honey wine, in the three largest groups of Indo-European migratory groups. Those who traveled to Persia and India, 
those who traveled to Northern Europe, and finally, those who traveled to Southern Europe, namely Greece and Rome. I would, given the opportunity, talk about that at length. But as much as I would love to tell you otherwise, pirates were not known for their mead drinking. Still, though, by the classical, Hellenic, and Hellenistic ages, grape wine was very much king in Greece and Rome. At the height of the Roman Republic and into the imperial period, wine was an ever-present facet of daily life. Now, good wine, the good stuff, was reserved for the aristocratic leaders of the Roman Empire, but everyone in the empire, everyone but the very destitute, had access to wine. It was a staple of every table. It was available at every restaurant, it was used in nearly every recipe, and it was enjoyed both watered down and at full strength, depending on the occasion. And that brings us to the final topic we are going to talk about today, the questions of intemperance, of sin, and sex. I think that in the medieval era and into the modern world, there is a certain masculinity associated with the production of alcohol. We tend to picture German monks making beer, or, more prominent these days, heavily bearded hipster lumberjacks making craft beer. And whiskey, I mean, it's always big Scottish dudes or big dudes from Kentucky hauling those barrels around, but in the ancient world things were different. As far back as recorded history goes, the production of alcohol was almost always associated with femininity, which honestly I prefer. I can really picture a woman in ancient Greece wearing one of those loose-fitting Grecian dresses, stomping my grapes, and wait, no, no, not like that, but, you know, you can see the image there, right? A group of women with those cool, kind of circular braids that were so popular in the ancient world, stomping grapes and tending the bees and wildflower apiaries and producing the wines that were enjoyed by everyone. And for the aristocrats that actually owned the finest vineyards in Italy, I'm sure they did have something like that. Beautiful, virginal slave girls doing just that and then serving them the very finest wine in the world at their very well-furnished dinner tables. But for the rest of us, for the rest of the world, down here in the muck, reality was a lot dirtier. And I assure you, there was nothing virginal about the women making the wine. From India to Athens to Rome, even all the way up through Gaul and into Britannia, wine and beer was made almost exclusively by prostitutes. And I've been trying to find the polite way to put this. I'm having a hard time doing so. So I'm just going to be blunt about it. The world's oldest profession is a job with an age limit. It's not something that one can do forever. And you know, for a very few, for the very beautiful or very lucky or very intelligent, some of them might have been able to turn their profession into a really lucrative gig. You know, a rich nobleman might snap them up and add them to his harem or to his household. And there were a number of women all throughout history that were able to transition into trading more in intrigue and secrets than in trading flesh, and to do so much more profitably. And then, of course, there were those that served as madams of their own establishments, but for the vast majority of prostitutes in the ancient world... And we should remember, they were almost all slaves here, and frequently didn't speak the local language. But for nearly all of the women in that position, they were not so fortunate. They worked in brothels. Their job was prostitution. And it's not cool, it's not nice to say, but their customers usually chose to spend their money on the young and pretty girls. Or, if we're being honest, in the ancient world, just as often young and pretty boys. And that all might sound pretty terrible. I'm sure it wasn't a constantly joyous occasion for anybody in that position. But it very probably wasn't as terrible as we might think. 
Much more often than we find in the modern world, the brothels were owned and operated by women, sometimes in a kind of communal fashion. And you know, these were women who usually didn't marry. To survive, they had to look out for one another. That's what the prohibition of prostitution gets you. You get drugs and abuse and human trafficking and pimps. Instead, you could have houses of ill repute that, in reality, weren't all that bad. You know, they had rules and they had guards and they could choose not to accept customers who broke the rules. And that communal life, that life where everyone looked out for one another, means that they would occasionally, even often, build very real and strong friendships and relationships. This is, sure, it's interesting, but I'm making a special point of it today because we see a very similar kind of culture emerge in the Caribbean round about 1700, especially in the ports of ill repute. But I remember a book I was reading a long time ago that had a main character that was a prostitute. She was getting a bit older, though, not elderly, but no longer as young and pretty as she once had been and she was worried that she wouldn't be able to support herself for much longer. It was a terrible situation to be in. But for most of recorded history, that's not how things usually actually worked. In those brothels, especially in places like Rome, brothels that were often owned by women, you didn't just get kicked out and left to starve to death because you no longer had the charms that you once did. They had a culture of mutual support. But beyond that, there were a ton of other jobs in the brothels that needed doing. First, and this is worth note, there was the performative aspect of the brothels that you find so often in the ancient world. We're talking about music and song and poetry and theater. In ancient Rome, legally speaking, actors and prostitutes shared a class with one another. And then there were also jobs like, you know, the cooks and the servers. You could, in a brothel in the ancient world, expect a bit of dinner theater. But the most important aspect of the brothel, probably financially speaking, even more important than the sex, was the drink. As a patron, sure, you would enjoy a few goblets of wine, but it was so much more than that. Instead of hipster lumberjacks, it was usually women who worked for the brothels that made the wine. Not just for the brothel, but for wine enjoyed by nearly everybody in the empire. In a very real way, aside from dealing in flesh, these brothels were wine merchants. There are more than a few accounts of wine merchants in places like ancient Rome who went to the brothels to negotiate the buying of large quantities of wine produced at or nearby the brothel, wine that those merchants would go on to transport and sell on all corners of the empire. Now, I hesitate to use words like nefarious here. I'm actually pretty fond of the tactics used, but the brothel certainly had its advantages in that situation. I mean, imagine you've got a fat, soft wine merchant, and he walks into a house that is filled with a host of pretty young women who were very skilled at pleasing men. And I'm sure that those women were wearing their very finest dresses when they brought out the wine for sampling. And I'm certain that the madam or whoever was negotiating with the wine merchant would have implied that he would have been free to sample everything that the house had to offer, provided he cut a good deal with the brothel. And I'm looking at this from the perspective of a straight man, but oftentimes, while their husbands were away transporting wine to all corners of the empire, it was the wives that actually did the negotiation. Or maybe in an attempt to combat the nefarious tactics used by the brothel, maybe they would employ a gay man to negotiate their wine purchase, but not to worry. These brothels had plenty of wine, anything to please any palate. It was big business, and, make no mistake, the women behind that business guarded it jealously, violently, more often than not. As we said, those brothels employed guards to make sure none of the customers grew too unruly, but 
If necessary, those same guards could be employed to break a few kneecaps. This was Italy, after all. The merchants, though, those who traded in far-flung corners of the empire and even beyond, well, they often experienced a far less enjoyable time at the other end of their journey. You know, in Rome or wherever they were buying the wine, they might cut a good deal and enjoy a few extracurriculars, but once they arrived in Gaul or even in Germania, it was often still the women there that negotiated the buying of the wine. But in early Roman Gaul and for the entirety of the empire in Germania, instead of a night of pleasurable company, those German women were offering something far better. They were offering you a chance to keep your life. One does not mess with Germanic barbarian women. According to sources like Tacitus, they were even more free with the blade than their male counterparts. But back in Rome, and in Babylon, and everywhere else in the ancient world, these brothels, who protected their business jealously, well, they elicited a certain amount of resentment, as I'm sure you can imagine. For the profits they enjoyed, absolutely, but it's more than that. You know, these were independent women, making their own money free of any familial connections. They were using their feminine wiles to live lives of communal peace, and in some cases even a certain amount of luxury. And they were doing so free from the tyranny of some of the most patriarchal societies that history had ever seen. To the men in power in those ancient civilizations, it was just... Well, it was the worst. And you know, sure, those same men might patronize those establishments of an evening, but come morning they were in the forum denouncing them. They were dens of vice and debauchery and evil. In some cases, they would pass laws against drunkenness from these establishments. They would pass taxes to ensure that they could not make too much money. But still, they prospered. Later on, we would see these houses of ill repute as dens of nothing so much as sin. There is a reason that today we associate breweries more with German monks with those, you know, little bald patches shaved into their heads than with beautiful, alluring women with those cool circular braids. But that's the production of alcohol. You know, we still associate the enjoyment of alcohol with women. Just watch a football game and you'll see ads with women in bikinis who just happen to be carrying their beer down by their butts when you get a nice close-up shot. Label out, naturally. But that's the drunken, intemperate, and sexualized side of alcohol. You know, those sins might not be as anathema as they used to be in modern society, but they're still pushing the sin. It's no accident that as the Roman Empire saw the rise of the Christian Church and their much more strict moral codes, that the image of those who produced the alcohol shifted, that the reality of those who were allowed to produce the alcohol shifted. The ancient traditions, the thousands of year old human traditions of making and enjoying alcohol, were going to change significantly. That story, though, is going to have to wait until next time. Today I really did want to cover the entire story of alcohol from Babylon to Nassau, but it proved impossible. And I was rushing here. I didn't even talk about the Bell Beaker people or the Corded Ware people. But we will next time. We're going to talk about the alcoholic traditions in Europe and how that impacted and even forged the Age of Sail and the Age of Pirates. Last time, we talked about the history of alcohol in the ancient world, specifically its role in ancient Mesopotamia and Greece and Rome. And we talked about the role of women and brothels in the production and distribution of wine. Today, we're going to discuss... Well, this is something of a danger zone for me. See, what we're going to discuss today is one of my favorite historical topics, or...
Rather, it combines a bunch of my favorite topics. The spread of ancient nomadic peoples, their uses of things like language and of writing, their pottery styles, their cultural and even religious norms, and naturally their use of alcohol. It would be very easy for me to go off on any of those, deep into the weeds, but we do have a particular point we're trying to get to today, a point that matches our current point in our overall story. So while we are talking about the European alcohol tradition, we're going to be moving fast. Because it's not only that, we're also going to incorporate the Islamic tradition and the Southeast Asian tradition to finally come to light on a bottle of rum. This is episode 112, The Water of Life. We begin today in the mists of prehistory. At least it's prehistory for the people with which we are concerned today. Down in Mesopotamia, they were writing down laws and account ledgers and epic poems. They were deep into their recorded history. But the people we're talking about today are what linguists call the Proto-Indo-European peoples. It's a name that indicates the spread of their language and their language family, from India to Europe. Now, in the early days of the study of linguistics, they called these people Aryans. It's a practice that, for obvious reasons, they stopped in the early 1930s. There is, though, a bit of a swing back on that pendulum in the last few years. Some scholars have reclaimed the term, using phrases like the Indo-Aryan peoples. But still, early linguistic theory could easily be misconstrued to equate culture and language with things like race and blood. And it has been, to disastrous effect. See, these people lived, as far back as we can tell at least, in the Eurasian steppe just to the north of the Black Sea. They were pastoral nomads, by which we mean they did not have a home base, they had limited agriculture, but they herded livestock. They herded donkeys and camels and goats, and most importantly, cows and horses. And over the centuries, these proto-Indo-Europeans began to mutate. They developed the stomach enzymes necessary to digest dairy. Or more accurately, they developed a genetic component that allowed them to keep their dairy-digesting enzymes. You know, that's something that we all have as babies. It's how we digest mother's milk. But the Proto-Indo-Europeans kept that enzyme into adulthood. It allowed them to digest things like cow and horse milk, and most importantly, cheese. Now, it's important to remember that when you're discussing the movement of peoples in this era, you're talking mostly about culture, you know, language and religion and writing and pottery. It's not really about race. But there is a genetic component to it. Mainly, for our purposes, it's that dairy digesting thing. Now, some anthropologists today think that this may be given more importance than it deserves, but the conventional wisdom tells us that this was among the most important developments in every region that these Indo-European peoples would touch. Now, digesting dairy may seem like a small thing, but it means that those peoples were able to take their food sources with them. They weren't tied down to the land. They didn't have a significant portion of their manpower tied up in agriculture. This gave them an amazing military advantage. Beyond that, they rode their food sources into battle. You know, the horse and, later on, the bridle were unbelievably important advancements in military technology. And, oh God, the chariot! I mean, from India to Persia to Troy and Greece and Rome, all of the ancient world, chariots are one of the seminal pieces of military technology. And the thing that ties all of this together, the theme that we find in the story of the Indo-Europeans is mobility. Horses and chariots are methods of travel. So, these Indo-European peoples, they traveled. And they did so mainly in three very large migrations. The first of these migrated east and south around the Black Sea, 
These are the peoples that would eventually become the Persians and the Vedic peoples of modern India. Then there's a group that traveled west and south around the Black Sea. And we find some of the oldest evidence of those migrations in the Balkans on the Black Sea coast. We find pottery and scraps of writing and traces of alcohol on the pottery. But those are the peoples that would eventually found city-states in places like Troy and ancient Greece and Rome. Now keep in mind that these were not single, one-time, giant migrations of peoples. You know, not 200,000 people on the move. These things happened over centuries, or even millennia. You would have these slow, gradual build-ups of what the local peoples might consider barbarian nomads on their borders. But eventually, it would lead to war and conquest and the establishment of some of the great empires of the ancient world, much of it on the backs of chariots. Or, just as often, even more often, in huge formations of horse archers, very similar to those of the Huns and Mongols. Now, just to touch on these two groups, who we aren't really concerned with today, I would like to note that in both those that would populate Persia and India, and those that would populate Greece and Rome, we find phrases like, the water of life, or sometimes water of the gods. It's pretty clear that this phrase in the ancient Proto-Indo-European language was what they called alcohol. And we get a bunch of our words for foodstuffs from this Proto-Indo-European language. The apple, for example, or rather, the apple was actually a word for any kind of fruit. But you also have words like honey and honeybee. All of which are also found in our third group, the group we are concerned with today, the group that traveled north and west from that Black Sea region. They traveled north of the Carpathian Mountains into modern-day Poland and Germany. And these are called the Proto-Germanic peoples. And you can begin to see why some of these ideas, you know, linguistic distinctions mainly, but why they can become so problematic in the 19th and 20th centuries. You know, these are groups of peoples that did have military advantages and used those advantages to conquer much of the known world. But millennia after those advantages were no longer relevant to their world, they were believed to have some sort of racial superiority. Those movements are the reasons why Symbols like, for example, the spinning cross, an image that represents nothing but the night sky or the zodiac, an image that was in use in all of the old Indo-European peoples from India to Ireland, well, you can see how that symbol might be misappropriated and stained with blackness when the Nazis adopted it as the swastika. There's a ton of this stuff, and this is the stuff that I could go on and on about for a long time, but isn't really relevant. As for our topic today, the alcoholic consumption of the people of early Europe, there isn't a whole lot of information prior to the arrival of the Romans. You know, we have some of that archaeological data we find in other regions, you know, traces of amino acids on fragments of pottery, but it's the Romans that give us the first written historical record of alcohol in northern Europe. Now, most of that is in relation to the Celts and the Germans consuming Roman wine. But the consensus in works like those of Tacitus or even Julius Caesar is that that Roman wine dulled the barbaric sensibilities of those Gauls and Germans. It's also worth a mention that Julius Caesar did make note of the people of ancient Britannia making cider out of crab apples. But we do know that the Germans and the Gauls liked wine and ale, and by late antiquity they were producing their own in huge quantities. And when I say the Germans, I'm not talking about the people of modern-day Germany. I'm talking about the Germanic-speaking peoples all over the late Empire and early Middle Age periods. That includes the Vandals and the Goths and the Angles and Saxons and the Franks and Burgundians, basically everybody who wasn't a Roman, and a lot of people who were Romans at the fall of the empire. And their traditions in beer is one of the 
most famous culinary achievements of the Germanic peoples. But even perhaps more representative than beer, at least in the medieval era, is mead. And we talked about the widespread consumption of mead last time, but I think it's most famous in these Germanic peoples. You know, you've got Odin making a sacrifice of his own body to bring poetry and mead to the people in the Vedas. You've got the mead hall in the real world, which was important, but also in fictional epics like Beowulf. In those stories, as in the real world, it was the king's responsibility to provide his housecarls, his fighting men, with mead. And even the name, Beowulf, translates directly to bee hunter, so probably a bear. But it's associated with bees, and therefore honey, and therefore mead. Now the consumption of mead is actually an interesting metric for the spread of the Indo-European peoples. You know, you can follow their migrations better through archaeological evidence of mead than through their language. Because everybody was drinking mead, and mead was transported in pottery, which tends to last. Runic inscriptions, which were often made on wood, didn't. Naturally, this is an imperfect tool. I mean, trade does happen. There was Indo-European mead transported into regions where there weren't any Indo-Europeans, but once a certain critical mass of pottery and evidence of mead is found in the archaeological record, we can assume that the Germanic peoples had become at least the dominant group in a region. But it's at this point, about the time that Beowulf was written, that we need to shift our focus to the east. As early as the 800s, Muslim chemists were distilling spirits from wine. This was when the Muslim world was enjoying its first flourishing of the Golden Age, when scientific and mathematic advances were flowing out of the Islamic world. Much of it was based on the writings of the Greek world that they came to inhabit. See, the medieval Muslims were less prone to destroying knowledge than the Catholic Church of the same era, so they were able to learn from it and build upon it. And they called this alchemical formula alcohol or alcohol in the Arabic. Now, the distillation process that they developed made it to Italy by the 1200s, where medieval Latin named it alcohol. But that name, I mean, it's just a little bit heathen isn't it? I mean, they were, after all, at war with the Muslim world. Europe was well into its Eighth Crusade by that point. And the kings of Europe didn't much care for these Moorish words like alcohol. So instead, they used one of their ancient words. They named this distilled ethanol aqua vitae, the water of life. Now, we noted that this is an ancient phrase in the Indo-European language, but by this point it was mainly in use as a reference to holy water in the church. However, within about a century of distilled alcohol's introduction to Europe, it became synonymous with spirits. You know, you might have beer and ale and wine and mead and aquavite. The production of these spirits is synonymous with and absolutely condoned by the Catholic Church in this era. I mean, in moderation, absolutely. Excessive drunkenness was considered a sin, but in monasteries all over Europe, the water of life was being distilled. In fact, the names for modern alcohols from different regions all reflect this practice, this naming convention. There's an Italian aquavite. There's a French brandy called the U de V, a direct translation of water of life. The word from vodka probably derives directly from a Slavic translation, maybe in Poland, and most famously, and I'm not going to try to pronounce it in the Irish here, is whiskey, which means literally water of life. Whiskey was being distilled as early as 1400 in Ireland, but oddly, 
the production of aquavitae had yet to really catch on in England. The Scottish were developing their own distinct varieties of whiskey, but not the English. Now, this is probably due to the Norman domination of England at the time. I would note that in other Germanic and Anglo-Saxon parts of Europe, there is evidence of the distillation of mead. It doesn't seem to have a name of its own, at least not that I can find, but it did exist, and today you can find fortified honey wine, which I highly recommend. But in Norman England, they preferred to drink a good French drink, namely French brandy, or sometimes eau de vie. And it, you know, was difficult to grow grapes in medieval England, so they didn't produce their own, but more than that, so many of those high-ranking Norman nobles had lands in France that were growing the grapes that were producing the French brandy that was imported to England. So why would they dilute their profits by allowing production of aquavitae in England? But this might seem strange, because soon England is going to be maybe the largest producer of alcoholic drinks in the entire world, or at least the English world will be. But to get there, to get to that point, where England is producing more aquavitae than anywhere else, we need to go back to the east, even further to the east. In 7th century India, there are records of fruit wine and honey wine, and then there's a drink they called brum or broom. It was a wine, but probably distilled later on. However, exactly what was in brum is shrouded in some mystery. However, Marco Polo does seem to shed a little light on that mystery. His journals make reference to a fine sugar wine, a wine made out of cane sugar. And once Europeans began to show up in Southeast Asia in large numbers, we see a ton of examples of sugar cane wine all over Asia. From the Malay people in Indonesia, in the Philippines, anywhere, really, that sugar cane could grow. And this sugarcane wine was something of a delicacy. Everyone seems to have enjoyed it, but it was the sugar itself more than the wine produced that really drove the Europeans wild. I mean, it was the search for territory that could grow sugarcane that drove the early age of exploration. Christopher Columbus himself brought the seeds for sugarcane with him to America on his second voyage, and before you knew it, as soon as Europeans began colonizing the New World, it was, it was being grown everywhere. What they began to call king sugar was the single most important product of the Western Hemisphere. It eclipsed tobacco and cotton and hemp. It was the most important agricultural product. It, in itself, just sugar, rivaled all of the spices of the East Indies in economic impact. And you can see visualize the way that it changed the world just by looking at some old paintings. I mean, look at images from Elizabethan England. You've got these trim, slim men like Francis Drake in nearly every image, but just a few decades later, nearly all of the men, with a few soldiers notwithstanding, but nearly every man in those paintings is a bit rotund. And then, of course, it was sugar that was driving the slave trade. I mean, sugar was one of the integral factors of the triangle trade. It worked kind of like this. The sugar that was grown in the Caribbean was shipped to England. And in England, they traded the sugar for money and machinery for more sugar processing and goods that were needed in the colonies. Then on to Africa to purchase human beings, and finally back to the Caribbean, that's basically the triangle trade, but there is a stop we skipped that would make it really more of a square trade. After departing the West Indies before heading for England, ships often stopped in the North American colonies. Now, the North American colonists, especially in the early days, didn't have money for processed sugar. That was expensive stuff. But they did have money for the byproduct of sugar manufacturing, for molasses. And you can use molasses in some recipes. 
you know, we still see it today in a number of traditional baked goods, I think, especially in American baked goods. But you can only bake so many cookies before you have this glut of molasses barrels filling up your warehouse. So the Americans, and we're talking really early colonial days here, you know, bunkhouses and palisade forts with maybe one or two cannons from the ship they sailed over on. And in that kind of frontier situation, purified ethanol is very useful. It cleans wounds, it cleans mouths, and most of all, probably, it cleans water. But those very early Americans began to make a sugar wine from that molasses, and then they began to distill it. Now, this concoction tasted terrible, but it was strong, it did the job. It was used well for cleaning and water purification, and they could mix it with fruit juice to make it almost drinkable. And in that case, it, well, it got you drunk. But it's hard to say where the word for this distilled sugar wine comes from. Now, there are a lot of possible answers here. A lot of ideas have been postulated. Rome, for example, both the name of the city and from the ancient Latin, from the Roma people of Central Europe, even from the Native Americans, but I think, and the most convincing argument is that the name comes from Asia. Probably it came to America through the English sailors who were traversing the entire world. You know, we mentioned this Brum from India, a sugar wine, but there's also Rum from the Philippines, which probably both derive from the Sanskrit, a proto-Indo-European language. And we do know that the English word for this distilled sugar wine was borrowed by the French and the Dutch and the Spanish. It became the name for this drink. And here we are obviously talking about rum. The first reference in English to rum in writing comes from a brief description of the island of Barbados in 1651. It reads, quote, The chief fundling they make in the island is Rumbullion, alias Kill Devil, and this is made of sugarcane distilled, a hot, hellish, and terrible liquor. End quote. And you know, the omnipresence of Kill Devil, of rum, in the world and story of the pirates is. It, it's omnipresent. And it's something that we're going to be talking about a whole lot in the future. But for right now, it's that fundling that I want to talk about. King Sugar was big business for every island in the West Indies. It's why there were so many plantations, why there were so many slaves shipped over from Africa. But the production of sugar was often subsidized, or rather funded, by absentee owners men who hoarded the profits from the sale of processed sugar for themselves, men who lived in England. So most of the money produced by that sugar was flowing back to the mother country. In the colonies, both in North America and the West Indies, they made their money mostly from rum. And before long, this rum bullion was competing in terms of profits with raw sugar even in some areas outpacing it. In at least parts of North America, hogsheads of molasses and casks of rum began to be used as a, a kind of currency in place of hard coin. And that's a big deal. If a cask of rum can be traded for slaves or crops or books or clothes or luxury goods, if it can be used rather than the king's officially minted silver... Well, that makes it very, very easy to circumvent the tax man, doesn't it? This was, in effect, it was smuggling. It was a black market, but it was the largest part of the American economy by about the 1680s. That's a big part of why King James II was so eager to interfere in New England affairs, why he installed Edmund Andros to get the trade under crown control. Of course, the people of New England wanted nothing to do with Edmund Andros or those restrictions on the part of the crown. 
So in 1688 they kicked them out of New England, but it was that same year that the English had their glorious revolution, and William and Mary were installed on the thrones of England. But William and Mary had the same problems with the American rum production that King James had. And it's this that... Well, I wanted to talk about all of this today, all of this history, and all of it I skipped over because I find it fascinating and I enjoy this history. But there is a reason I wanted to talk about alcohol production, and specifically rum, at this point in our overall story. In 1690... King William and Queen Mary passed and promulgated an act for the encouraging the distilling of brandy and spirits from come and for laying several duties on low wines or spirits of the first extraction. Which is a snappy name. This act, though, did two big things that are going to impact our story. First, it prohibited the import of French brandy. That part of the act reads, quote, an act for prohibiting all trade and commerce with France. All brandies, aquavitae, and spirits are prohibited to be imported into this kingdom. End quote. French brandy was still big business in England, but this is an expected move. I mean, they were going to war with France. The second bit, though, is more important to the pirates. It reads, quote, be it further enacted that all distillers and others who shall make any low wines, spirits, or brandy shall brew or cause their corn to be brewed and made into clean and wholesome drink. And, it goes on, from such drinks so made and prepared, without any mixture with any molasses wash or tilts or other materials whatsoever. End quote. Did you catch that? If you didn't, don't worry, they're going to reiterate it for you later on in that paragraph where they say that spirits need to be, quote, made from drink, made of malted corn entirely without any mixture aforesaid. End quote. By which they mean molasses. Now, when they say corn, they mean any grains, not, you know, maize. That means that drinks like whiskey were still allowed, And more to the point, gin would be a legal spirit in England, which is going to make the 1700s a hellish period. But this act restricted, severely, the production of rum. The biggest business, the chief fundling of nearly every West Indian colony, was restricted. Barred in some locales. What's more, England was a mercantile economy the people of the empire weren't permitted to trade with anyone outside of the empire. Now this act, well, I don't want to dive in too deep today, but imagine this. Imagine that you're a planter, the owner or operator of a plantation in the West Indies, someone who produces sugarcane. Now most of the profits from your processed sugarcane, the raw sugar, most of those profits go back to England, but you had been able to earn a tidy living by selling rum. And then this new king bans the production of rum. The one way that you ever made any kind of money is just snatched away. So what do you do? And I'm not saying that this did happen, but wouldn't it be handy if in that situation you happen to have access to a crew of rough-and-tumble criminals, you know, sea robbers, real Robin Hood types, who might occasionally steal a shipment of rum from, say, a French vessel in the Windward Passage, maybe, a ship that they could take to their well-defended base at Nassau and then sell this stolen rum to whoever they wanted to. After all, they were pirates. They weren't bound by legal restrictions. This would be a, if it happened that way, a neat and tidy way to avoid the prohibition of rum production, wouldn't it? Which catches us up to our overall point in our story. Now, as far as the Pirates of the Round are concerned, aside from the drink that they were enjoying there on Madagascar, rum and alcohol in general doesn't play a major factor because... They were stealing from the Muslim world, and by that point, alcohol was forbidden. 
But when we shift our focus away from the pirates of the round back to the Western Hemisphere, after this prohibition by William and Mary, the theft and black market sale of rum is going to be the biggest business of every pirate in the Caribbean. I'd like to thank everybody for listening. I'd like to thank everybody that has helped to support the show. Everybody who has signed up to become a patron on Patreon. Everybody who has left us ratings or reviews. And everybody who has recommended this show. You all make it possible. Thank you. Our theme music was, as always, The Old Captain by the fantastic band Brillig. If you haven't checked them out yet, you absolutely should do so. You can find them at brillig.com.au. That's B-R-I-L-L-I-G dot com dot A-U. After you're done over there, you can visit us at piratehistorypodcast.com, about which, keep your eyes and ears open. We have news in the works. But as always, and most importantly, thank you for listening.